Tonight we have two speakers, and they are both Norwegians, and they come from each from a different century. Um, so that is going to be very exciting. I look at the camera. So they, they come. They come from each one. One is from one century, from the last century. One is from this century. So it's going to be very exciting, and they're going to tell us about growing up in Norway. So that's. Um, I will introduce the first speaker which is the youngest one, and um, she is Elisabeth Ling Lingos. From, uh, she grew up in Olesund on the west coast of Norway, um, and Olesund is a town of about 66,000 people. At the age of 17, she came to Hillsborough, Oregon, to attend uh, one-year high school and returned to Oregon in 2018 to attend PSU. In 2020, she was accepted into a scholarship program. Now we do not know why Elizabeth came to Oregon again after returning to Norway. But I think it has something to do with matters of the heart or maybe something romantic. But I think she's going to tell us about this later on. So our second speaker tonight is Bjorn Helgeli, who was born in Trondheim, Trondheim. Bjorn retired from a career around things, all things mathematical. He has, however, devoted his time to things in the artistic world, which include music, composing, acting, and storytelling, just to mention a few of his activities. And I have to say, he makes the best apple pie in Oregon. So let us welcome the two Norwegian speakers. And together, we will make a trip to beautiful Norway, and we will learn how it was to grow up in that country, in the last century, and in this century. So, Elisabeth, you are on. Thank you. So, my name is Elisabeth, and I grew up in Olesund. I was born in 2000, so I will talk more about how it was to grow up in the 2000s. So, in this picture, I was just born, and I was a very happy baby. So like I said, I grew up in Ålesund, and Ålesund is known for its Art Nouveau, because in 1904, the whole city burnt down, and uh, Germany came and helped us to build it up, which is why the style is pretty inspired from the German Art Nouveau. And I love growing up in Ålesund, because it's at the coast. Like you can see in the picture, it is a lot of fjords and ocean around it, which means it's perfect for fishing, which is one of my favorite hobbies. And I'm very happy that I grew up in the nature because it has taught me so much later in life. And I will go more into that a bit later. And Olesen is also known for having the fjords because the Atlantic Ocean goes through the city. Like you can see on the left side, the whole city is split by the big river going through. And when I, w I grew up with my older brother and my two parents, they were very glad in going outside. They love hiking, which is something that has adapted onto me later on. And my older brother, as you can see on the bench there, his name is Frederick. Me and him, we grew pretty close, but then a bit later on, I got a younger brother. And you can see in this picture here, we are in Oslo, in Vigelandsparken. And the sculpture, some of you may have seen it, is called Sinatagen. It's a very famous and popular tourist attra attraction in Norway. And then, like I mentioned, later on, I got my younger brother, Petar. He is my best friend. We would do everything together growing up. We would explore the outsides together. We would run around and do crazy things. We would build tree houses and just be normal kids running around and having fun. And when I came to the US for the first time in 2017, Petar was kind of jealous. So he wanted to come to the US as well because he's never been here before. And this fall, he's actually going to study in California, so we won't be too far apart. So that's really exciting that I'll have someone else here in the US. And when I grew up in Norway, I never really thought about how lucky I was to have the nature around me. I was not really thinking about it, but then as I moved to other countries and traveled around the world, I have quickly found out that the nature is not something you can find anywhere in the world. Especially when I come home after being gone for a long time, driving down my street and you just see the fjord and the mountains everywhere, it's just something special. So I've learned to really appreciate the nature even more after being gone for a long time. And then here are some pictures from my childhood being outside. <laughs> in the first one there, you see my dad holding me on the front and my older brother on the back. He <laughs> had to carry us a lot when we got tired. 
And then in the two other pictures here, you see me as a baby digging in the sand, looking for crabs. I was pretty much outside as long as it wasn't raining too much. You would find me anywhere outdoors. And this place is a five minute walk from my house. This is the most peaceful and my favorite place in the world to me. In the summer, I always come here to relax. I come here to swim, to fish, and we have barbecues there as well. And it's called Burgenfjorden. And this fjord goes all the way in nor into Norway. And here's some other pictures, like I mentioned. I loved being outside. Here's me picking berries. And we would make strawberry jam with my grandparents when we would pick berries. And that was one of the most thing one of the things I was the most excited about in the fall because we knew it was time to be with my grandparents and squish up those berries and have something good for our bread rolls in the winter. And then for Easter in Norway, my family a lot of times we ha make Easter eggs and sometimes we have lamb for, uh, for dinners. But the thing that I like the most about our Easter is how we are a lot outside, like I already said a lot, we are outside almost for everything. And in this picture, we, that was an Easter in 2006 where we went to the ocean and we just had a bonfire with hot dogs and the lumpe, which is a tortilla made of potato that we put around our hot dogs. So that's one of my favorite childhood snacks, the the tortilla around it and then when I tell people here that we eat that they think I'm crazy because you can't have a tortilla around a hot dog but for me that's just completely normal and one of my favorite things to eat when I'm just looking for a snack. And growing up in Norway for me like uh, I really liked fishing. My grandpa he lives in Hardanger which is about an hour drive from Bergen and every single summer we would go to Hardanger uh, to visit him and my grandma. And to me, Hardangar is the summer paradise. There was nothing better than going to them for the summer. I didn't want to go to any other countries. All I wanted to go to was Hardangar, to go fishing, pick berries, and make the jam. So in this picture, is actually from my first fishing trip ever. I was two and a half years old, and I was kind of surprised to see a fish for the first time. But eventually, I learned that fishing was actually really fun. And sometimes in the summer, we would go fishing and then sell fish to the neighbors or just give it away to the cats in the street because <laughs> I don't really like fish myself, actually, but that's why I would give it to other people. So here we are also in Hardanger, me and my brothers fishing with my grandpa. And then this year, or 2020, I actually went home to Norway for eight months because of the virus. So these two images here are from this year, last year. On the left side, you see my grandpa. He was really, really happy because when I came home from the US, I told him on the phone that I really wanted to come see him because I hadn't seen him for two years. And he was really happy and asked me if we wa I wanted to go fishing with him because we had not gone fishing for maybe eight years. And then <laughs> we went to go fishing and that one day we went, we actually ended up getting no fish. So it was kind of a fail, but we still had a really good time. and. That's probably my favorite picture of my grandpa that I've ever taken because uh, you see how he just took put his clothes on in a hurry because he wanted to go fish early in the morning and he's wearing his mountain boots with his shorts and his shirt is barely on. He was just so excited to go. <laughs> and then on the other picture, you see me holding a fish. That was the day I actually was able to get fish. And this is outside the fjord, which was a five minute walk from my house. So yeah. Fishing is actually a really important part of my life. It might sound really weird, but I just have a lot of good memories from fishing. And here are some other pictures I want to show you before I move on to more traditional things about Norway. So when I went to Norway this summer, I took some pictures from Amlam and Lovatne. Amlam is a place that is about 10 minutes away from my house. And it's a beach that is really popular to go to because we don't have any white sandy beaches where I live. We usually just have to go to the rocks and jump down in the fjord. But this specific place, Amlam, is a place we gather to play volleyball and we actually celebrate our midsummer f uh, party here. A lot of people from the whole city of Ålesund go to this area and there's a big grass field where we have a big bonfire and then we sing songs or we have barbecues and we play volleyball and we swim in the middle of the night with the the sun still being up because it's midsummer and I have a lot of good memories from there as a kid too and 
it's definitely one of the best places in Norway to me. And then on the other side here, we have Lovatne. That's actually the first time I have ever been there last year, but I definitely would recommend everyone to go there at least once in your life because it's the most beautiful lake and place I've been to in Norway. My boyfriend, which I will talk more about later, and I went there for camping and we were able to go fishing there and we rented a, a little boat that we went out on and it was so beautiful and I didn't even know a lake that beautiful existed in Norway. <laughs> it was just the most beautiful place I've ever seen in Norway. And then now I'm going to talk a little bit about our traditions and Christmas and so on. But first, I just wanted to tell you some fun stories from winter and snow from when I was younger. So here you see the same lake I showed you where I would go fishing, but in the winter. And then that's my street. You will need to remember that for later because th there's a fun story about the hill. And this is the hill that I'm talking about that it's really hard to get up with a car in the winter. But first, I want to talk about snow days, because <laughs> when I first came here as, as an exchange student in 2017, there was a lot of snow in Oregon uh, over the winter break. But then when school started again, it wasn't really snowing a lot. But then one day, the school told us that we were not going to have school that day because we had a snow day. And then I saw the email and I looked outside and I didn't see any snow. I just saw a little bit of snow in the grass. And I was wondering, why do we have a snow day when there's almost no snow? And later I learned that it was black ice, so I understand it. But then I was still so surprised because if you see these pictures here, we have a lot of snow in Norway and I've never had a snow day my whole life. So I think that was one of the first surprises I uh, met as an exchange student. I just thought it was crazy how they had snow days here when I was so used to snow. But then again, it was the black ice and I do understand it later on. And then since we were not allowed to have snow days, we had to find a way to get to school somehow. And now if you remember the hill I showed you, that's the hill we a lot of times were not able to get up during the winter and it was the only way to get to school. So if we had to go to school, but our car didn't work up the hill, we had to go uh, skiing. <laughs> and in the first picture, that was me learning how to ski. But in the two last pictures, in the middle and the one on the right, you see me skiing either home or home from school or going to school. So a lot of times we would end up coming late to school because we were about a 10 minute drive from school. So with skiing, it would be at least 40 minutes as a young kid. But those are just memories that are really fun to have and that I'm going to tell my kids when I grow up and my grandkids one day just how we had to ski to school and no matter the weather or the snowstorm. That's just some, some fun memories. And then, yeah, here's just some pictures. That's actually my boyfriend on the left. You see him, he came to Norway for the first time in 2018. And that was the first time he'd been around snow that much amount of snow. So we decided to build a really big snowman and it's, it's probably the biggest snowman I've ever built. It was almost 6.2 feet tall, I think, because he's six feet. So that took the whole day making that one. And another fun story about snow in Norway is actually, if you see the snow racers, that's what we call them. They are, you can sit on them and go down hills and they go really fast. So. For elementary school, sometimes if you didn't want to go skiing, you could bring those to school. And we would have, in recess, we would have a race where we would sit on a snow racer each, and we would go down a really, really big hill. It was probably not okay by the principal, but they didn't know, so we did it anyway. And whoever was able to get down the hill first would win a prize, like maybe candy or something from the other kids. And at the most, it would probably be 30 to 40 kids <laughs> sitting on one snow racer each going down the hill super fast. It was icy. We couldn't even break. And I think one kid broke a leg one day and we were just going crazy for it. But that's how it was in the winter. We loved snow and we just <laughs> wanted to be outside and we had a lot of fun. And here's me probably practicing for that race with the baby safe snow racer and then me and my brother drinking hot chocolate. And then Christmas in Norway. Christmas in Norway is probably my favorite holiday because of all the traditions that we do, at least in my family. We have uh, Advent, Advent, which begins four Sundays before Christmas Eve. And Advent counts down the days until Christmas Eve. And in my house, my mom would make us a homemade calendar 
with presents and I was always so excited to finish dinner to go open my presents because a lot of times it would be a tiny piece of candy or maybe a toy or something like socks or something like that. It was always fun to see what you would get in that calendar. And then we also would have lights, which I, is in the picture later on. So every Sunday until every Sunday of Advent, we would light a candle and sing a song. And we would also have Advent calendar at school with all the students bringing a gift each. And then each turn, each day, one kid would open a gift. And that was super fun because then we got two gifts instead of one. And here is me with my grandma in her dongnyeol decorating the, cre the tree. I don't know how it is in the US, but a lot of people in Norway wait to put up their tree until December 23rd because it's a tradition to wait until the very last day before Christmas Eve. And I loved decorating the, the tree with my grandma because they would always use a real tree, but back home I would use a fake tree. So I liked having to go uh, chop it down and putting it up and decorating it. And another fun tradition that I think does not exist in the US, I might be wrong, but I've never known about anyone doing it here, is the Yule book. So in my family, we didn't celebrate Halloween. That was something my mom didn't really like. And we were not, not a lot of people really did Halloween anyways. So our version of it was the Yule book. <laughs> the Yule book, we would dress up as Santa Clauses. And then we would walk around our neighborhood and sing Christmas carols and song, hoping our neighbor had some leftover sweets from Christmas. And usually they would know we were coming, so they had bought extra candy for us. And that's just really good memories, too. I loved Yule Book. Sometimes we would go twice just to get more candy. And we would, of course, share it with everyone. So that's us and the neighbor kids going around singing for everyone. And then another part and the reason for why I love Christmas so much is that I love baking food. I love just being in the kitchen. And of course, for Christmas, you have to bake all the good stuff. And I think we're even going to show you some of that food later on because someone brought us some Christmas food today. But in this picture, you can see us making gingerbread cookies and something called Yulemon, which I actually don't know what is what it's called in English, but it's kind of like just Christmas cookies. <laughs> And then we also made krumkake and we make kokosmakroner, which are coconut and egg white whipped together and it tastes amazing. So, and I think actually Christmas has made me love cooking because we would just make the seven types of Christmas cookies every single Christmas and it taught me how to, taught me how to cook and I'm, <laughs> I'm thankful for that today. Here's another picture of us. And we are making the gingerbread cookie, no, the gingerbread houses. And I've seen a lot of people do that over here too. But at least in my family, we would build the house from scratch. We wouldn't buy the kit, we would make it at home. And if you can see the little house in the background there with the four candles, that is the advent candles I was talking about. So for each Sunday, we would light one more candle. And then in the window, it's kind of a bad faded picture, but you can see another advent decoration that we put up for for Advent as well, so yeah. And because I just talked about how I love baking, I wanted to show you me and my grandma and the reasons I love baking so much. So it wasn't just Christmas that I would bake, it was also just everyday life. And I think a lot of kids in Norway are taught really young how to bake bread, how to bake and do everything. So I think that helps us a lot. I don't know how it is over here, but for me, I'm very thankful for having learned that from my grandma and my mom really young because it, it has made me love to bake sourdough bread. And now that I live by myself and I'm a student, I feel confident cooking. So maybe that's a Norwegian thing or maybe it's just my family. I'm not sure, but at least I love to, to bake bread. And then 17th of May is another favorite holiday of mine. So 17th of May is Norway's Constitution Day. It is from 1814, we got our own constitution. And for 17th of May in my family, we would always have breakfast together and then we would put on our bunad after we ate, just so we wouldn't spill food. And then we would go to the city of Ålesund and go in the parade together, or we would go with our school, close to our school. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the bunad. So in this picture, I'm wearing the Hardanger bunad, which is where my mom and my grandparents are from. And it's normal to get a bunad based off where your ancestors or your family is from. 
And I could choose to have an Olsen bunad because my dad is from Olsen, but I wanted to have Hardanger bunad because my mom is from Hardanger and I think it's the most beautiful bunad in Norway. Even though there's a lot of other beautiful ones, I think Hardanger bunad, maybe it's just my favorite because I have it, but I think it's beautiful. And you can see my brother in the background wearing the guy bunad, so for kids. And bunads, they're usually, you, for kids, you get old bunads that are your maybe your mom used when she was younger, but then for your confirmation, you usually get your own bunad. But the guys, most of the time, don't get the bunad for their confirmation because they have to grow. Uh, they usually grow after the confirmation and you would want to wait until you're tall and you've d you're done growing. But both of my brothers actually never wanted to get a bunad. It's becoming less common for boys or guys to get their own bunad nowadays. But all the girls I know in Olesund in Norway has a bunad. So for us, it's still pretty popular. And here's another picture of me for 17th of May. Here we can see the bunad a little better. Um, for the bunad, you see the on the in the middle of the Hardanger bunad, there is a piece, a pattern that has pearls. It's kind of hard to see it from far away. But that pattern that Hardanger bunad has is usually one unique pattern for each family. So my, I think, I believe it's my great, great grandma. She believed our, pa she made our pattern and my aunt is the one who makes it. So it's handmade all of it. And the same goes for the hat. It's a really old hat that has gone past in past generations in my family too. And then here's another picture just to show the different types of bunads. This is me and my two best friends from elementary school, the ones that I would do snow racing with. <laughs> so the girl in the middle, she's wearing a bunad. I believe it's the a type from Olesund, a little bit outside Olesund. You can get that one in blue or black. And then my other friend on the left, I'm not sure what bunad she has, but you can see that they're all different versions and they look very different depending on where you are from in the country. And every single town and small part of Norway usually has their own type of bunad. So it's really cool when you gather in a parade and you see all the types of bunads that are there. And then before I'm done talking, I just wanted to say a little bit about why I came to the US and why I'm still here. So as you can see in this picture on the left, I'm wearing my bunad with my boyfriend and he is not from Norway. <laughs> he is born in the US, but his parents are from Mexico. And when I came for my exchange year, I met him and I fell in love with Oregon. But what I didn't say is that I also fell in love with him. So when I was done with my exchange year, I, I didn't want to leave. But of course, I had to finish high school in Norway. So I went back home and I applied to go to Portland State to study business. And then I got accepted. So I moved back the year after I was done. And I've been here ever since, pretty much. So, yeah. And my boyfriend is actually learning Norwegian. And... We might move back to Norway some years in the future, but we most likely want to stay in Oregon to work and be close to his family. But he's actually becoming pretty good at Norwegian now, and I'm really proud of him. He's learning a lot of Norwegian culture, and he's becoming pretty good at it. So, and if you have any questions, more questions later, we'll answer later on. So, yeah, that was everything about me. Thank you so much for listening to my part. My name is uh, Bjorn Hegling. I was born in Trondheim, Norway. Uh, Norway is a country of 5.3 million people, 150,000 square miles, just a little less than California. I wanted to show you a picture of my parents, Hildur and Bjorn. And this is my first year in Fagevika, which is right outside of Trondheim. This is my mother. And uh, this is a later picture, and this is shopping with mom. You see she's got me harnessed so I don't get away from her, I guess. I was active in, in scouting while I was in Norway. And this is a first grade class, a little bit school uh, in, uh, in Trondheim. And there are five, five boys here in this picture. 
And here they are, about a year ago. I had lunch with eight of them. Yeah, there was eight of them. And I, I see them every time I go home. It's, it's really kind of cool. This is uh, the center of Trondheim. You see that little uh, obelisk or whatever you want to call it there. On top of there is uh, Olaf Tryggvason, the Viking. He's the Viking king of Norway. And he founded Nor uh, Trondheim in the year 997. And actually this whole thing here, it's, it forms a sundial. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. OK, sorry. This is Nidaro's uh, cathedral. It's huge, as you can see by the people in front. It was built around the year 1000, and it's constantly being maintained. As you can see, it's quite large. It's, um, I think it's a phenomenal uh, uh, church. This is the River Ned, Nidelven. It's a, um, it's a big salmon river. Uh, uh, the English rent part of it every year in common fish, uh, huge salmon that comes running up the river. Trondheim is also uh, known for its uh, University of Science and Technology. It's actually a leader in, in innovation. Now this is uh, what I, where I grew up in this area. It's called La de Moon. And over to the right you see a, a church where I was confirmed. And then there's a re, uh, row of houses there. I've got an X on top of the uh, roof on one of them. That's where I lived and grew up. Right there it is. In that building, there's the church. That's where we lived. We moved in there in 1939. Yeah, I, I played in the boys' band. Uh, I played the clarinet. And then, in 1940, uh, war came to the country. Yeah, I, I think that's about the, one of the first things I remember uh, very well uh, was the Germans goose-stepping through our, through our, uh, our, our um, street. My mother, she cried. I guess she knew what was coming. The war brought a lot of problems, a lot of shortages. The Germans took all the food. We were rationed, we got, we got some. The farmers were making food for the Germans. So, uh, and of course we had Nazi school teachers. And uh, we used to give them a tough time, played all kinds of pranks on them. I remember one time there was a truck coming down the street and it made a right turn and a, a big cart, a carton fell out. And, and of course, we wanted to see what was inside. So we ran over there, opened it up and it was full of bonbons. And we hadn't seen candy at all. So we had knickers on and we stuffed it inside our, our knickers. But then the, the truck stopped and the Germans came out. They, they realized that they had lost something. And we took off up into the woods where we used to play all the time. The Germans run after us, but uh, uh, they didn't have a chance up there. We, we, knew that we knew the territory, and they didn't. The English would uh, come uh, at the last two years of the war. They would come and bomb this structure, the submarine bunker. It's built right on the fjord. But it... it it didn't phase it. It's just massive. And so um, then they would bomb the fjord side and cover it up. And then every uh, next morning, uh, the Germans would come with their dredges and dredge it. So this went on. And, and every day we were, every night, we had to go down in the basement and listen to the bombs drop. Uh, it wasn't much fun. And uh, in, our, in our complex, uh, in apartment complex where we lived, there was a Nazi guy. He was living on the third floor. So we had, we had to do something. So we, we'd run over and, and ring the doorbell from down below, and it rang, rang up on the third floor. So they were having a party 
And so he came out and looked. Of course, nobody was there on the third floor. We had already been down below, and we were gone by that time. Then we waited a while, and we did it again. Ring the doorbell, and he come out. He was getting a little... And then we did it the third time, and he got really mad. He figured it was kids were just playing pranks. So he, and he was uh, three sheets into the wind, I think. Anyway, he ran out on the balcony, a little veranda, and he shot his Luger off three times in the air. Well, a block from where, where, where he lived was a school with a ger full of Germans. They were staying there. And this was toward the end of the war, and the Germans were getting a little nervous about the war. So they came out with machine guns, and they started shooting at everything that moved. And we were flat on the floor in our apartment. The bullets were fly flying all over the place. Quite an exciting time. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I included this picture of my dad because he had a friend that had a bakery. And of course, all the, all the bread went to the Germans. But he'd go in there uh, once or twice or three times a month. And his friend, uh, Petter was his name, he'd, when he came out, he had a, a loaf of bread under, the, under his coat. So we, we said, that's the go to the bakery coat. And then the war ended, and uh, I was standing on the corner there on the lower left, left uh, where those big brown buildings are, and uh, and the alarms sounded. You know, we had the we had the uh, uh, alert alarm, which is short blast, and then the all clear was long blast. But this one was a steady, steady blast, and we knew then that the war was over, and and uh, and everybody went crazy dancing in the streets. It, you know, it was a capital offense to have a flag during the war, a Norwegian flag. But I stood there, and all, all along those apartment houses, all the way down that street in the middle, every window a flag came out. It was just a sea of red. Never forget it. I'll never forget it. That was a day. And the flags were flying. And this is the 17th of May. The 17th of May in 1945 was quite the deal. As you can see, all the people are out. This is where I went to school, Lilleby School. Eh? We used to walk to school, or sometimes we'd ski. But uh, the schools were a little different, not too much difference, I think, but very disciplined in those days. The boys were in separate classes from the girls. And we studied penmanship and geography, art, drawing, pretty much, you know, mathematics, history, pretty much the same, a little bit different, perhaps. This is our uh, neighborhood uh, soccer team. That's me on the front, on the left. These are, so, these are the guys I grew up with. And I see some of them every time I go back. And in the, in the apartment complex where we lived, we started up a, a theater group. It was called Echo. And we wrote a, a cabaret, and we put it on. And you can see the names there down below are all the, all the players, all the actors. We put it on in Student de Chamfene, which was the biggest uh, uh, place in uh, in Norway to perform, uh, in Trondheim to perform, and so we we advertised in the paper and we packed the house. It, it was it was amazing, and we had a lot of fun. There were some uh, there were uh, some musicians in the complex and they played for us. We sang, we danced, and we put on skits. It was great. We had a good time. So then I, then I got a letter from the theater in, Nor in Trondheim, Trendelag Theater, to come and, and try out for a play. You know, I, I really something. And, and then I uh, played. This is one of the plays that we played. 
uh, this is put on four kids by the kids. Okay, Liv Ullmann is on the left. She was a trender, and I'm, an, I'm, I'm the one with the big nose. This was sort of a Pinocchio uh, thing. And then I got a role in uh, Atnor, and uh, that was, it was an adventure for me. And that's me in the middle, and that's Thorat Mørstad on the, uh, uh, that I'm looking at there. So I was uh, pretty awestruck about the whole thing. And this is the, uh, this is the review we got in the paper, which was uh, pretty, pretty darn good. So I had a real adventure. I can't make it go, whatever. Yeah, this is now the uh, permission to emigrate from Norway to the United States. And everybody's waving goodbye. And here we are in, on Stavangefjord, underways. My, me and my, oops. Me and my mother uh, thinking about what lies ahead for us. My dad and my mother there. And there are my naturalization papers. I, in December 6th, I became, 1956, I became a U.S. citizen. You had to wait five years, and then you had to take a test. You had to know something about the country. They wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, make you a citizen. Now, I want to just, uh, in closing, I want to talk about the fact that I have been involved with the Norwegian uh, in the United States all my life since I came to this country. And I was on the uh, president of District 2 uh, in Sons of Norway, which is Oregon, Washington, uh, Idaho, and Alaska. And then I, w I was on the international board, and I was on the committee, actually, I was in charge of uh, establishing uh, lodges in Norway. So I went to Norway, and as that, we had dinner with the King Olaf. Uh, uh, we had a, a convention in Oslo in 1981, and that, that, was, quite, that was quite an experience. Now, I, oops, I'm a, one of my hobbies is wood carving, and I, I, can, I do it in the Norwegian style to maintain my heritage, because my great uncle was a master carver. And here's, a, and here's another, there I am carving my, at my workman. The other hobby that I have, well, here's my portrait. It was painted by my wife. As you can see, the, the likeness is striking. And I have another hobby beside wood carving. I like to sing and play old Norwegian folk music. So I'm going to do one for you. Oh, dansen den går ut på Måkerskär Det lyser sommernötter Gutten svinger den de har kär I nattens friske vind Blåser så härlig fra haven här Det skvulper och det skvetter Badet i lys ligger måkerskär I ill och måneskjen Kom i kostervals Slå din rönne arm om min hals Ja, dig föra få Vifter og går Koster valsen går Vek oss med klir I skriver oss når Ja, er din Og du er min Aller kjæreste min For ut på nøtter Finns jo verdens deiligste kvins Jeg har en lita tull Som er med tro som gull Og hele øya er full og når jeg tar meg en vals med figgens arm om min hals Da ligger jeg inga nu, det skulle jeg gjerne dø Her er smil med på dette rød Karoline, Karoline, Karoline Vær hos tro Og hun synger mens vi gynger Karoline, hun er god
Okay, we have a few questions for you. Um, thank you, both of you, for just amazing talks. I feel like I've gotten a chance to visit Norway yet again. One of the things um, that's come up is the Norwegian life, Elizabeth. Um, now it's trending to have the outdoor life as it is in Norway. You hear about it everywhere. Even our children are talking to us about it. Um, and you clearly had that when you grew up. How do you manage that here and why do you think it's so important? That's actually a good question. And after I came to the US, I must be honest, I haven't really had the chance to be outside as much and it's something I've been missing. That, maybe it sounds weird because Oregon is one of the best states to actually be outside in, but after I came, I haven't had a car. I haven't really had the chance to travel further away than Portland metro area. So I've only gone to parks and I've, I've always wanted to go fishing here, but I haven't had the chance to do that yet. So once I get my car, I will definitely go camping and go explore more. But so far, I've only been going for runs in the neighbor area and I've actually passed by Mount Hood going to Bend one time. So Bend is probably the first I've been nature-wise. But I I think if you grow up here, you for sure can experience some of the same things because you have the beautiful nature around here. But personally, I haven't had the chance to do that yet. But I will. <laughs> Great. Bjorn, you were talking about growing up during the war. And I we were thinking about your parents and how hard it must have been to explain to children or to tell them how to behave and to say the right thing and not the right thing. How did your parents sort of explain all that to you? Well, uh, one, of the, one of the things uh, that my, uh, my dad talked to me about is how I would approach the Germans. And he, I think it was, uh, stay away from the Germans uh, because they were they were kind of touchy uh, not so much to the kids but uh, but to the to the adults they were very suspicious you you weren't supposed to have a radio mm -hmm. okay if you had a radio you were taken out and shot it, it was really it was really harsh uh, my dad was a painter he painted pictures, and we were out in the, in the country where he grew up uh, on one of the farms of one of his friends there, and he was painting a picture. And a German car came in, and they arrested him for, for being a spy. And uh, I guess they interrogated him and said, you can't paint up there because they all of, see the mountains that you're painting have a lot of uh, military installations in them. And he says, he told him, no, you can't get anything up in those mountains. I used to play up there. I, this, is where, this is my country, and I don't believe that. Well, they slapped him around some, I guess, and let him go. But uh, they, uh, from then on to the end of the war, he was followed. Somebody mm -hmm. was following him, and that was, uh, that was very uh, disturbing. Yeah. To say the least. Oh. So. Well, Elizabeth, thinking about your parents, you've wandered all the way to Oregon, which is a fair ways from Norway. Um, how did they feel about that? And is that a common thing for young Norwegians to do now, to travel all over the world and study elsewhere? dreamt about going here since like I was 12, 13 because I had seen about a lot about the U.S. in the movies and for me even a yellow school bus was exciting before I came. Everything was just so big to me so for years I dreamt about coming here. So they were kind of prepared but I don't think they really realized I was actually going to do it until a year before I went even though I talked about it. So for my mom it was pretty rough having me leave that young because 17 you're still a kid in their eyes you know. But then as the year went on, she knew I was safe and with a good family. So I think she got, she started feeling better. And of course she was very happy when I came home. 
And then she thought I w- she would have me there forever. But then I told her about my boyfriend and how I wanted to go back. <laughs> so once again, she had to to go through having me leave. But now that I have my boyfriend and she's met him a couple of times in Norway, she is not really sad anymore. I think she's more happy for me that I'm going where I want in life. And as for how many leave from Norway, when I went to high school for my junior year, it was around 200 people uh, in my grade. And I would say eight people left from high school. But from Ålesund, it's not really that common to leave. It's a small city. But if you live in Oslo, I know a lot of people that go for an exchange year abroad in high school to study. Because in Norway, you can get that year for free if you're being accepted by the government. So I think a lot of people go if they have the chance. But of course, each of their own. Not all people want to leave that young. But a lot of people are doing it. But a lot of people go to other countries like Australia and England and stuff. But... The U.S. is the most popular country, though, because of the movies, how we are getting excited about everything we see from American (laughs) movies. Bjorn, why did your family decide to immigrate, and have you ever had second thoughts about that? Well, my grandfather, my dad's father, um, and... My grandmother's brother, they came to Oregon uh, and worked uh, down in Rainier at a sawmill down there. Oh, yeah. And so my, and so my, uh, my father had an uncle here, and, and, uh, and then his, uh, and an aunt. Yeah, his aunt uh, uh, had a, a a flower flower shop in Portland, and uh, and then after the war, uh, the the aunt, her name was Jill, came to visit, and also, <laughs> well, there's a, it's a long story about uh, 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 another. My my grandmother's brother was coached by my grandfather's bro- uh, brother to to come to Oregon, so he came too. Well, they came and visited a couple of times, and especially my, uh, my, great, un- my great aunt, Aunt Jill Geiger was her name, and they talked a lot together. And so after that is when we, he uh, they, um, uh, applied for a visa to, co- to emigrate to America, and that came much faster than he thought. So we had to ch- make a decision. So we decided to, I guess we decided to go. You know, I was just informed that uh, we're going to go to the United States. We're going to go to Amer- America. I thought it was great. I, uh, it's adventure. I was uh, 16 years old. And I said, well, gee, that sounds like fun, I guess. So uh, we went here. And uh, no, I haven't had, I haven't had any re- regrets, uh, except maybe lately. I, <laughs> <laughs> I might think about uh, there was a time when I thought about moving back, but it didn't happen. No, I have a uh, family here, and and it's worked out pretty well. I got a good education. I graduated from Portland State, and I got my master's in math from University of Washington. So I did pretty good, and uh, I have no complaints at all. I just hope this virus uh, now can. Get uh, get itself out of here so we can come back to some normal living. We all, for sure. Well, I see lovely food in front of you. I'm curious if you want to point out things that are special to you, uh, starting with Elizabeth. But also, when would you eat that kind of food? Okay, I'll start with the waffles, if that's okay with you. So when I was younger, I played soccer. Um, after school and when we had soccer games we actually had like this small kiosk on the side of the field where a parent would stand there and sell sodas and waffles after the game so my memories with waffles is actually from being done with a soccer game really warm and sweaty and i'm so hungry and then i go over and i buy a waffle for a dollar with strawberry jam and it's right out of the iron and it's so good so that's when i would eat a lot of waffles but then also just for like late night food we call it kvalsmat I don't know why you would call that in English. Kvalsma. Kvalsma. Yeah. The evening meal. Yeah, the evening meal. Sometimes we would have warm waffles with jam and milk before we went to bed. And yeah, that's my favorite memories from waffles. Yeah. 
But I always like left some myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I like I like all of it, but left side and, and uh, uh, we always make our own lefsa here. We have lefsa all the time, especially at Christmas time. And krumkake and uh, sunbakels and all kinds of good, good, good stuff. Well, I'm um, listening to these two stories. I'm curious what you see the biggest difference in childhood in Norway now versus when you grew up, Bjorn. Do you see much difference? Cell phones. Cell phones, yeah. But. I'll make a comment that, that impressed me very much. When the war ended in Norway in 1945, we had, in my opinion, it was the best time of my life. Hmm. It was, everybody was together. We've been through hell. And everybody was together. There wasn't a chance that a neighbor was going to do anything or steal anything from a neighbor. It, it was, a, it was a, a good feeling. We had no crime, none, no crime at all, right after the war. You know, the first five or six years. I'm sure that that's different today, but... It was a wonderful time. Everybody was together. Hmm. Well, I obviously don't know how it was to grow up in your time, but I think some differences, maybe some similarities are that we both like to be outside when we were kids. That's something maybe all kids in Norway have in common, that nature, no matter what year you're born, makes a big impact on you, if you can agree with that, I don't know. And then... Of course, growing up in the 2000s, you have more technology around you. You maybe kids are more on their phones now. I, I have some. Nie I have a niece, and she loves being on her iPad watching movies. I'm sure back then you, of course, didn't have that opportunity. So maybe back then kids were actually more together and socialized more. Like you still have your friends from all the way back then, and you still know each other. I'm pretty sure I won't know my friends when I'm old, like the way you do. So I think that's something I wish we still had that social aspect was the same because I think social media and technology really takes that away from you in a way. Yeah, and I think uh, young people have more opportunity now in these days to travel. You know, we have jet planes now and and when I grew up uh, there weren't that many cars. You know, you still see uh, horses and stuff on the street. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot more, tr more opportunity to get out into the world and see the world and meet other people and go to uh, advantage, take advantage of educational opportunities. Well, I'm wondering if there's anything you haven't had a chance to talk about that you want to just add at the end. Anything you want, free mic. Do you have anything? I actually have a question for you that I wanted to ask you. So when you came to the U.S., how did you learn English, or did you learn it before you came? Because when you were talking about it, I started to wonder. Yeah, how that I was, was lucky for you. because I got into a, a neighborhood. There's a whole bunch of young people there, and I, one guy, uh, I was trying to learn English, and one guy sat me down one day and he says, "Bjorn, I'm gonna teach you how to speak English." Every day at noon, you're going to meet me here during the summer. After school, you meet me here. One hour. And he taught me how to speak English. And so I don't know how well I speak it, but I uh, don't seem to have too much trouble. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm also very proud of the fact I've been here 70 years. I'm proud of the fact that I speak Norwegian very well. I can confirm that he does speak Norwegian very well. <laughs> Well, we're curious. We know there's two kind of Norwegian languages, Bokmal and, and New Norsk, um, but they're all the dialects. So we're, and I know traveling around Norway, I don't understand them at all. So I, can I don't you, wonder you don't understand most of them. Can you demonstrate how they're different for us? And then I'll turn it over to Osa. 
the, uh, I'd like to speak to that. There are probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dialects. You go from one valley across the mountain down to the other valley, and they don't speak the same language. Mm -hmm. Where I came from, the language is horrible. We just substitute letters for, uh, for words, and we cut off all en endings, and, and it, is, uh, it is really a harsh uh, dialect. Um, in, in Oslo, you know, in Oslo, them snakker, uh, ja, nesten bokmål er Oslo, ikke, ikke sant? Ja. Det er yeah. sånn er det, og, og, og det, det forstår alle, ikke sant? Mm -hmm. Men av en Bergen, they say, well, I'm er from Bergen, I'm er, er not from Norge, you know, I'm er from Bergen. Eh? Hopeless. Terrible. It's hopeless. Yeah, and then up north, and then of course where I come from. I from Trondheim. I from Nesjemere. Have you ever heard such a language in all your life? <laughs> and up north they sing when they when they talk. So, yeah, I from Nordland. Do you know that they are going to be a Nordland language? So can you just talk in Norsk and be Jordan? And that's just only a few. How about Stavanger? Huh? Well, Stavanger, the, the Stavanger is like um, Bergenspråk, yeah. Well, it says that if you meet a Norwegian, he says he speaks eight languages, seven of them are Norwegian. Norwegian. But Very I good. thought didn't, didn't Denmark gave a, a Norwegian the language, but you really made a mess out of it. <laughs> so, thank you so much. It was absolutely great. Both of you, you were, you were really, I'm so happy that we asked you and that we, you, you became a very good team. Thank you so much for doing this. And then I would also like to say that um, on February 5th, we have um, Barbara Funkhauser. She is a prof professional storyteller. She um, will delight us with um, a presentation called Beauty Secrets of the Gods. And she's going to tell about trolls and she's going to talk about giants. And, and she is absolutely fantastic. We have had her three times before when we had the lectures at Portland State for a full house. So it's good both for, for adults and also for children. So come and listen to Barbara Funkhauser. And then March 5th, uh, we have a presentation called Echoes of the Kalevala in the novel of Deep River, which is uh, the speaker um, actually wrote um, uh, Deep River. His name is Karl uh, Malantis. And uh, he is, by the way, also a Rhodes Scholar. And um, he is a very, supposed to be a very good speaker and also a very good writer. And I have to tell you, you, if you have never met a Rhodes Scholar before, you'll meet one. Because only 32 people are chosen every year in the U.S. to become a Rhodes Scholar. It's a very special kind of thing. And um, so come and listen to him. And we have also other lectures, but I'm not going to tell you about the rest of it because you can't handle all this. So... Remember the 5th of February and the 5th of March. And thank you for sitting at home and listening to this. I can't say thank you for coming because you didn't come. But anyway, someday we will meet again. I know. And we will come over here and we will have a lot of fun. And we are going to have refreshments afterwards. And everything is going to be back to normal. But for now, we just do it remotely. So thank you for listening. Goodbye.